So I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Sendil Mullanathan. Dr. Mullanathan is the Roman Family University Professor of Computation and Behavioral Science at the University of Chicago Booth. In past work, he's combined insights from economics, behavioral science, uh, and behavioral science with causal inference tools, including lab, field, and natural experiments to study social problems such as discrimination and poverty. He recently co-authored Scar Scarcity, Why Having Too Little Means So Much, and he writes regularly for the New York Times. He's also helped to co-found a nonprofit, uh, as well as the Center to Promote the Use of Randomized Controlled Trials and Development. He's also a recipient of the MacArthur Genius Grant, and his current research uses machine learning to understand complex problems in human behavior, social policy, and medicine. So I'm calling this talk Human and Machine Intelligence in Medicine. What I hope to give you a sense of is the role of algorithms and obviously people in healthcare. I'm gonna do that by giving you three stories. Each of those stories has its own narrative arc, but even if that doesn't hit your particular area of interest, I'm telling these three stories because they're connected. And at the end, I'm gonna to pull together the threads from them and give some general principles about the role of algorithms in medicine and, uh, and in healthcare more broadly. So let's just dive in. Let me tell you uh, story one. So the first story is actually about a patient coming in to the emergency room. So there's a common dilemma that um, emergency room doctors face. The patient may come in and they may have chest pain, perhaps trouble breathing, maybe some nausea. And the ER doc has to make a decision at this point. They have to make a decision as to whether, first of all, what's wrong with this patient. But obviously, one of the things that could be wrong with this patient is that they could be having a heart attack. Now, the thing about heart attacks is that they are pretty hard to detect uh, just on the, basis, on the basis of symptoms alone. After all, you could be having chest pain and nausea, and really that's just because you had some bad Indian food yesterday, because uh, chest pain and stomach pain are very hard to differentiate. Now, there are some easy tests that you could just run right there. You could look at their ECG. You could run a little lab test. Uh, but currently, at least, lab tests and, uh, and ECGs are not that conclusive. So really, your choice as an emergency room doc is to decide whether you're going to test for heart attack. I'm going to say test for heart attack here, but that's usually a panoply of tests involving some kinds of stress tests and catheterization. Now, this is a tough choice because these tests are both invasive and expensive. So you don't want to do them on everybody who comes in saying, I've got chest pain. But at the same time, you want to test for heart attack if they've had it, because if we can find it and treat it, you can deal with a lot of, um, of the consequences of heart attack. In fact, this is one of these very highly effective treatments, uh, stenting and bypass surgery, that you really want to deliver, but you want to deliver it to the people who have, heart, who have had heart attack. This brings you to the challenge of the ER doc in this situation. Who should I test for heart attack? Now, we have a bunch of data, we know who is being tested, who's not being tested, but it raises a natural question about algorithms. Could we build an algorithm to help the doctor decide? How would we do this? Well, let's take everything the patient sees. Well, not everything. This is gonna be an important thing. It's some of what the patient sees. This is often glossed over when people talk about algorithms. We don't get the, the visual of the patient, the conversation, we get what's in their health record. So take some of what the patient sees and then predict whether given what we knew about the patient at the time, can the algorithm predict whether this person will have a positive stress test or catheterization. Now, if we do that, it'll help us better understand where there are mistakes in testing and whether, where we can do better. So that's what we did. We took a large electronic health record data set, and then we proceeded to build an algorithm to predict for the patients who were tested whether the stress test or catheterization is positive. Now, what I'm gonna show you is the results of that decision aid that we built. And I'm gonna start by showing you what this looks like vis-a-vis -vis the app. Now, I should just explain what this is. On the x-axis, we put all the patients as a function of their predicted risk from lowest risk on the left to highest risk on the right. On the y-axis, we put the yield rate of testing, okay? Now, these are all the uh, tested patients, okay? Sorry, these are all the patients altogether. So the first observation here is that though there's an average yield that looks like this, there's enormous variation, predictable variation in yield. What this means is, look at this lowest decile. 
This is 10% of all patients. Testing them is incredibly cost ineffective. Yet a huge fraction of these patients are tested. And the first decision aid thing the algorithm tells us is it tells us something that lots of people have been saying about healthcare for a while. There's a lot of wasteful tests. Now, typically when you hear wasteful tests, you hear incentives, you hear other things, but this says there's an algorithm that we built here that would allow you to say, hey, I can tell on the basis ex ante of characteristics of patients that it's not worth testing this patient. How much is it not worth it, testing? If you pick the 40% of tested patients that are least risky predicted by the algorithm, you could cut them all out and basically have a negligible effect on positive heart attacks found. There's basically a ton of tests that have no chance of finding anything. So the first thing we find here is overuse, overtesting. But there's something optimistic. We should test some people. The top decile, hugely cost effective. Less than 70,000 per life year is the value of testing these patients, given the yield and the benefit of treatment. But there's a puzzle here that we found, which surprised us. In this top decile of patients, 57% of them go untested. The story in healthcare is often about overtesting and overuse. Here we find that, but we're also finding underuse, a ton of potentially missed heart attacks. Okay, well, how do we know there's actually a problem here? This is just the algorithm's prediction. Well, we took these patients and we followed them over time. And we said, what happens to them in the 30 days after the visit? And here's what you find. These riskiest patients go on to have heart attacks at incredibly high rates. And I haven't put this up here, but we have data that shows they die in the next 30 days at very high rates. In fact, this is a clinical decision threshold at which we should be testing patients. And these patients have incredibly high risk. So what we've learned from this is that the conversation is around overuse, but in actuality, there's a lot of both over and underuse. But more importantly, I wanna point out that algorithms can see things that we can't. But as the human mind is, and this is why it's human and machine, the human mind is limited in its capacity to process information. Algorithms, purely empirical objects, can suck information out of data pretty readily. And this has some pretty important ramifications. Let me tell you an example of what I think is the most extreme ramification, not even about algorithms, but about how we conduct public policy uh, for healthcare in the United States. Here's a graph that you've probably seen um, versions of many, many times. So I put on the x-axis risk of patients, y-axis testing rates. And typically what you tend to see is you tend to see high testing regimes. In our data, these are shifts that test a lot or shifts that test very little. High testing regimes tend to test more and low testing regimes tend to test less. And a lot of the overuse discussion is about this end of the curve, the left-hand side of the curve it says, look, why are we testing so many people that's wasted? We should get the high testing regimes to look like the efficient low testing regimes. In fact, lots of public policy is about creating incentives to move the high testers to look like the low testers. But look at what this curve tells you, good news, the high testers cut a lot of wasteful tests. Off, sorry, the low testers cut a lot of wasteful tests. Bad news, the low testers also cut the very valuable tests. All of healthcare policy appears to be throwing out the baby with the bathwater. We're indiscriminately lowering tests, both the valuable ones and the invaluable ones. We just don't realize we're doing it because we're looking at average yields when you can use algorithms to break out patients and really do a precision analysis of risk by patient, you start to see that actually we need to rethink how we approach uh, public policy here. And so this is leading us to rethink the underlying source of the problem. But the other obvious thing of course here is that, well, we have a fix. Let's build these decision aids and diffuse them and they can potentially make a big difference. So that's the lesson I kind of want you to take away from the first story or at least the message is the first story. We'll return to it in a bit. Now I'll move to story two. So the second story involves uh, care coordination programs. Care coordination programs are a kind of uh, program developed by healthcare systems that 
most of you probably know something about, but I'll walk you through it. So if you know anything about the cost structure of health systems, um, a few people account for a large set of costs. These are people who have many chronic conditions. In other words, you've got diabetes and renal failure. You've got high blood pressure, high cholesterol, you're overweight. You know, you've got a constellation of problems. You've got several chronic conditions. And you will therefore will likely be the one that accounts for most of the costs. Now in any industry where you have some people accounting for a lot of the costs, what do you wanna do? Well, you wanna deal with them differently. And that's what care coordination programs are. Hey, why don't we set up a special helpline that will help these people? For example, I have a number I can call and that's the number I use if I feel like I need something. And that person will tell me, you know what? don't come into the emergency room for that, you're fine. Or actually for that, definitely come into the emergency room. And that's a way to make sure the right people come in and the wrong, the wrong times people don't come in and clog up resources. So these programs involve a lot of extra resources that you give to people. Now you'll start to notice a theme, just like in the, in the uh, testing for heart attack, who, who should we give these extra resources to? Health systems can't give them to everybody. And you know, I could count the number of chronic conditions, but that's hardly the best way to do it. This is where algorithms get involved. You, should pr you can predict, given everything you know about the patient, how likely are they to have lots of um, utilization in the next year? How likely are they to need a lot of care? Now, there are algorithms that are already at scale. They affect about roughly 80 to 120 million, depending on how you count it. And they're already being used. So this is not like an algorithm we built, but this is algorithms that are already out there. Our interest in these algorithms comes from a different place. It was, as you can see in the title below in the science paper, it was to understand, are these algorithms fair? Do they have any sort of built-in biases? We're gonna focus on racial bias. And we've got access to one live algorithm that's scaled and, and it's one of the largest. And this program, this algorithm has enormous consequences for who gets in the program. How, the health system that we work with, but generally health systems tend to use these programs to predict risk, take that score, auto-enroll people with a very high score, and then give preferential treatment to, to other people with a high score who are right below the auto enrollment deadline. And so what we wanted to look at was, because this program is so consequential, how does it how does the score it gives people, the risk score, differ by blacks and whites? Specifically, let's take two patients who have the same risk score, one black and one white. Who is sicker? So we studied the racial bias in these algorithms. The principle, if it's unbiased, is that the same score, uh, blacks and whites should be treated the same, should have the same needs, and the color of their skin should not matter. So for the same score, health should be the same. And here's what we in fact find. This is the algorithm's predicted score. On the y-axis is a measure of how sick people turned out to be. This is the Gagne score. It's a measure of the number of active chronic conditions they had the following year. And what you'll notice is on the y-axis, you'll see this is the risk score for whites, and this is the risk score for blacks. And in fact, at the same threshold, let's take this dashed line, you can see there's a huge gap for the same risk score, blacks are much sicker than whites. How much sicker? At the auto enrollment threshold, 28% more chronic illnesses for blacks than whites. Now, how much bias is this, 28% more illnesses? If right now, this is the auto enrollment level, 18% are black are auto enrolled because of this score. If we remove the bias, 47% would be enrolled. It's a huge disparity in who's getting into these programs because this algorithm is biased. Now, a lot of things follow, uh, followed from this. Um, there was uh, investigations by a New York regulator. Now I should say we investigated one algorithm. There's actually several algorithms that have the same mistake built in. And there was a, the Senate had, up, uh, had some uh, investigations that, that are still ongoing. But what I wanna talk about is what went wrong and these are these are very good data scientists building, you know, using the latest technology. So how did how did we get such a big racial bias? Well, one clue is in where it's going right. 
If we look, do the exact same exercise, risk score on the x-axis, y-axis, now utilization, what do we find? No difference. The algorithm which showed a big bias by race for health outcomes shows no bias for health utilization. The problem was the algorithm was designed to predict utilization, not health. It's a very subtle error, but black and utilization and health are pretty commingled, but blacks and whites do not have the same relationship between health status and utilization because whites have better access to healthcare. In fact, at every level of health, blacks utilize less healthcare. That means if you build an algorithm that's very accurate at predicting utilization, it is sure to be biased at predicting health. So that's the proximate cause. Machine learning algorithms are trained with a label. In this case, the algorithm optimized the objective was given, but that's not our full objective. We're not interested in utilization, we're interested in health. So what, there's a deeper cause. Why was cost chosen and not health? Now, I think the reason is actually kind of basic. You'll notice that if you look at many papers on health policy, utilization and health are used synonymously. Why? Because the way we measure health is through utilization. We have claims data. We use claims data to decide on health. Wait, but claims is utilization. We use EHR data to decide on health. And actually some fields of EHR data is are actually utilization fields. So unless you're very careful, if you just go about your business in a regular way, you'll easily confuse utilization and health. And in this case, we'll see that confusion when percolated through the algorithms can have big consequences. All right, let me move on to story three. So the third story involves knee pain. For those of you who don't know, osteoarthritis is the most common joint disorder in the US. Um, it affects a large percentage of women, uh, men and women. 10% of men over 30 and 13% of women over 60 have knee osteoarthritis in particular. This is such a big problem. I had not appreciated until working on this. So between back and knee pain explains a huge percentage of people who are on disability insurance in the United States. Now, one of the things that we became interested in is that in the context of knee osteoarthritis, obviously the biggest problem you have is pain. And one thing that's known in the literature and which we replicated in our data is that disadvantaged patients, whether race, income, or education, who have osteoarthritis experience a lot more pain. There's a huge pain gap here. I'll get to what the numbers mean in a second, but just trust me that it's a huge amount of, of, um, of, of, size, uh, uh, of, of um, bias in, in pain, bias huge disparity in pain experience by race, by income and education. So why is there a pain gap? There are two explanations for why the disadvantaged feel more pain. One is it's inside their knees. You told me they feel more pain. Odds are that's because their knees are in worse condition. There are physical ailments that are more extreme. The other is that there are problems outside their knees. So you may, by virtue, and there's something very evocative about this, that for the same kind of knee injury, for the same kind of physiological sensation, it may be experienced more acutely if you're disadvantaged because A, you may have a lot more life stress. You may have different pain coping strategies. You may have less social support. You may just even have less access to pain medication. So this suggests there are socioeconomic problems that lead to greater pain, not physiological problems. So how do you tell this apart? Well, easy. You take this and you say, well, we have this gap. Why don't we go and condition on how severe the knee pain was and see if there's still a gap? And that's what this figure does. On the x-axis, we have what's called the KL grief. This is a clinical judgment of the severity of the osteoarthritic problem and worse left to right, the disease is worse. On the y-axis, we have pain scores. Now, this is not my doing. The standard Coos pain score has a, I can only describe it as a sort of unfortunate feature, which is that the lower the score, the more the pain. So the way you should read it, more pain this way, worse disease. Now you'll see here, therefore, the disease gets worse, curves go down, more pain. But now we've broken this up by black patients and other patients, and you'll see at every level of severity, black patients experience more pain. 
In fact, were you to run a regression and control for knee pain, the pain gap with controls is basically the same as the pain gap without controls. This seems like slam dunk evidence for the outside their knees explanation. The disparities we see and experience pain is not due to physiology, it's due to life circumstances. What we got interested in was, does this really settle the matter? I mean, what did I put on the x-axis, the KL grade? But medical knowledge is for the most part still in flux. It's why we still do science. And it's well known that the KL grade doesn't explain pain well. Now you could say that's just because there's a lot of individual differences, or you could say, hmm, maybe the KL grade is missing something. Maybe there's something in the knees that we don't know about. Are there overlooked physical features which might explain the higher pain levels of disadvantaged groups. This brings me to my, to my, what we did, which was we said, why can't we use the machine learning algorithm here to discover that? What would we do here? We would train a convolutional net to take in the knee x-ray, but to predict the pain of the patient. Remember, the algorithm is only seeing the x-ray and is only gets to predict pain. And it's given as the input, the image of both knees and the output it's asked to predict is the coos pain score in the knee. The key here is the algorithm only sees the x-ray. It doesn't have access to anything else about you, such as lab values, a signal inflammatory measure, um, nor uh, does it know anything about your race. Okay. What we find when we do this activity is that if we go from conditioning on the KL grade to conditioning on the algorithm's predicted knee severity, the pain gap completely disappears. The algorithm finds signal that says, oh, given what I think about severity, there is no disparity. There are in fact overlooked signals in the knee x-ray which help explain these disadvantaged differences. There's something remarkable about this story. The, the previous story was about racial bias. This story is totally different. We had a whole set of disadvantaged patients who've been coming in and telling the clinicians, my knee is in pain. The clinicians have been looking at it and say, no, I don't see anything. I'm sure you're fine. Here's some pills. The algorithm comes in and is actually getting rid of bias. It's listening to the patient. It's better able to listen to these patients than the clinical doctor. It finds something in their knees and it's what patients have been desperately trying to tell us all along. And this suggests algorithms are a force for equity, not for bias. So three stories, three very different kind of outcomes and color about algorithms. Let me try and tell you what I think the general lessons are above and beyond each of these stories. General lesson one, data, not algorithms are the scarce resource in this world. Let me go back to our heart attack data. How did we build this predictor? Well, we had a lot of, we had a great data science team. We spent a long time, but the truth is this activity is getting more and more commoditized. Relative to five years ago, there's very little difference in the performance of these algorithms by skill. You don't need to have the world's greatest data scientists. In fact, you may not even need data scientists at all. We have now auto ML techniques, which are producing performance, not that different from, from good teams. In fact, for some of our imaging work, and I've had some startups do the same thing, they've taken their data science teams best producing algorithms for medical imaging. And then they've said, We'll put that in one box. We'll just take the algorithms, upload it to one of these auto ML factories and see how they do. They don't do as well as the vision team, but they're so damn close. In many contexts, you're like, I probably would have just saved the money and used the auto ML, which is approximately free relative to all the hard work of uh, the computer vision teams. It's so good that for those of you who haven't tried it, you should try this teachable machine um, that Google has. You just go on there. I use it as a class assignment. It's awesome, even with just 100 images that are labeled, it can learn pretty well. All you have to do is upload images and give it labels. And then of course, there are more and more advanced auto ML out there. This is almost like an ad by Google for their auto ML service. So the scarce resource, technical skill is still important in some cutting edge problem, but it's sufficiently diffused that the real ed here is goes to finding the right problem, knowing to set up that the heart attack thing as the way we did and having the right data. In fact, in medicine, this is the single biggest bottleneck. And if we're to move healthcare and AI forward, this is the bottleneck we must break. And this is where all my effort goes to is in breaking this bottleneck. And I can talk about that in Q&A if people are interested. Um, the second lesson, 
Relatedly, it's not just the biggest resource, it's the biggest source of problem. AI breaks because the data is broken. I'll give you a quick example from a, a, a Google project from several years ago. This is an example from Mukun Sundarajan, who's at Google, and a team um, that had that there that had worked on this project. So that team um, had built an algorithm to detect pathologies in chest x-rays, which was very successful. And unreasonably successful at the time, because they were like, this is amazing. This is a few years ago before this was kind of now we had the tools to do this. And they were like, this is unbelievable. But they got interested and they said, hey, what is this algorithm looking at to make these great predictions? And that's where Mukin come in, came in. He had done a lot of, built a lot of tools for analyzing and making algorithms interpretable. So they applied these tools and they said, say on this X-ray, what part of the image is it looking at? Oh, look, it's looking over here. Why is it looking there? Well, let's zoom in and adjust contrast. And lo and behold, this is what we find. What is that? Well, it turns out that in this in this health system from which Google had gotten their data, the radiologists did something particularly fun, different, which is when they saw a problem in the x-ray, they would make pen models. And it turns out that the algorithm became good at detecting these pen marks. It wasn't a pen pathology detector. It was a pen mark detector. This is an absolute fiasco because the performance was notionally high, but that's extremely mo misleading. This algorithm was terrible at detecting pathologies when pen marks are not there, which is the use case that we have in mind. This is a reminder that the algorithm is only as good as the data. And in this case, the data itself was misunderstood. And I just want to talk you through that the biggest problem we have right now is bugs in data. We recognize that when we get some computer code, it may be buggy. We think the algorithm is doing one thing, but it's doing something else, such as shutting down when we don't want it to. ML systems have code as well, of course. That's why you hire coders. But usually, I've never seen the code in machine learning break once it's an industrial level. All the AI failures I know of, the algorithm did exactly what it was asked to. It is not like a bug in other kinds of code. Instead, the real code is in the training data. That's how we really program ML algorithms, is in the training data we give them. And that is where bugs arise. We think the data is one thing, but it's actually something else. And that's what we learned in the racial bias paper. We thought we were training it to predict health, but in fact, we were training it to predict costs. Who's responsible for debugging? It's not the data science team. It's those who know the data. And this is the biggest problem. The data can break because you didn't give it the label you wanted. The data can break because it's not representative of the deployment. So third lesson not representative deployment, unrepresentative data. Healthcare and AI is awash with unrepresentative data. This is a great paper in JAMA. And you'll notice all they did was they took and looked at what are the cohorts uh, from a bunch of deep learning algorithms that were trained. And lo and behold, what do you know? 39% of the studies come from California cohorts, 27% come from Massachusetts and 25 from New York. Gee, I wonder why that is. Of course, it's not just the geographic distribution. Why that is, is because these are all a bunch of academic medical centers that we're training on. So unrepresentative data is a huge problem. Now it's a problem for human knowledge as well. Why did KL scores underrecognize pain and the disadvantage? It's because the original studies were all on British people. You can go back, white British people, you can go back and look in the table and ask, what was the racial distribution in those papers? You won't find it because they didn't even have a table to describe racial distribution because it was so obvious what it was. There's, and the unrepresentativeness, both demographically, geographically, and importantly, as a function of the fact that we get data from academic medical centers who practice care very differently is a huge problem. All right, let me conclude on the last one, which is a distinction that shows up in um, uh, both the first uh, story and the third story. I want to describe, go back here and point out, when we had the original uh, paper, we have two approaches to approaching knee pain. Here's knee pain. There's a pain score. There's a radiologist who looks at it and makes a physician judgment of the grade. This, very, this happens all the time in imaging and AI in general. What are we predicting? We could have taken this x-ray and predicted KL grade. I'll call that automation. That is most of ML in medicine take some input, take what the clinician is gonna do and predict it. In other words, what you're doing is you're trying to build an algorithm that automates whatever human judgment was. That can be pretty good. It could have some cost saving, but you're also automating all of the errors and biases. Here's an alternative. You could predict the pain score, which is what we did. This is a very different approach. 
Here you're actually finding clinical novel new truth. To me, this is where there's the highest return. And this distinction between automation and prediction is to me a big divide in medicine. If we're going to have massive breakthroughs and they're not simply just put a few radiologists out of business, we're going to have to start getting data with ground truth labels, not just what clinicians thought. And so let me end on those four lessons and say, I'm very optimistic for the role of healthcare and for the role of AI in healthcare, but I think we have a, a lot of bullets to dodge to get there. All right, thank you. Thanks. We have a question from inside the room. Oh, uh, let me ask you one of the online questions while we're getting a mic. Um, so thank you for your insights into the value of algorithms to support equity and access for joint decision making. Um, are there ideas there for cellular, biologic, and IT data needs? Uh, yeah, I th uh, definitely. I am not as well versed in the biologic and the cellular, but I'll give it my best shot. Uh, I, uh, and the IT, we can talk a little bit about. And the cellular and biological, I think one of the most intriguing things is getting data that links um, bio, the sort of biological ground truth at one level, say things from assays and things like that, all the way back up to actual physiological outcomes. And I think one of the things that I've seen in trying to get data like that is that often the biological data sits in one place and what constitutes outcomes is like small data sets, et cetera. But we have an entire machinery for being able to get health systems to be able to do testing and producing data. If we can do that and link it back to their EHR, we'd have a link between this huge passive data, co data collection that's going on through the EHR and more active biological um, collection. Anyway, that, that's my best attempt at that. Uh, given my limited understanding. Gotcha, thanks. Yes, hi, um, I, I do quite a bit of AI to automatize, to automatize sleep scoring, uh, you know, like sleep studies. I don't know, is that on? Or? Um, I, th I think uh, we may not have the mic on here. Let me, uh, let me uh, ask one more uh, that's coming in online. So this is from Stephen Pollack. Uh, another excellent talk. Yes, the data are broken, including the so-called medical record, its promise and fundamental design. I guess you know what I might take from that is, um, are there changes that we could make to the data that we collect through um, our healthcare system to make it easier to train you know, algorithms that produce a meaningful positive difference as opposed to sort of go after billing? Yeah, I, absolutely. I think that I would say two things could change. So one is easier, which is the layer we put on top of the EHR data and that's already coming in. I think there's very little work right now to put in the amount of energy needed to make EHR data semantically meaningful, you know, because ultimately people just take the diagnosis codes and run with it. But you need to actually go back to the physician notes, look at the patient history. That's a lot of human capital that's needed. But if you look in other sectors and you look at the amount of energy that goes into data cleaning, it's not unreasonable to say 90% of your cost will be towards that type of activity. So I think building that type of semantic layer, I think a health system could do it, I think could start us off. But you could Im imagine that being something that health systems know they just have to pay on top of actually the data collection. The second is a pet peeve that I have around physicians' notes. So if you go back and look at physician notes from the 1960s, 50s, they were amazing, just spectacular. Why? Because physicians wrote what they actually saw in the patient, their thought process, what they were thinking, et cetera. Go look at physician notes right now. In one of our projects, we had physician notes. You look at it, about 50% of them are copy and paste. Like literally they appeared somewhere else. The remaining 50% are approximate copy and paste. There's just the amount of knowledge that used to be in physician notes has just withered away. And I think part of what we haven't done is we think of the IT problem as resourcing the, the sort of information technology. But what you actually need to do is to resource the human who's going to be entering that data so they have enough time to meaningfully capture what's on their mind. And you know, just look at the, the user experience of a doctor, A, from time and from entry. 
I think if we can fix that, there's a lot of information that could get pulled through. So my, my question was mostly about implementation. I, I think in all the cases you showed, it was very nice to show the bias and the possible pitfalls. But I think one of the key is once you implement it in, in a clinical setting, I think it's very important that there is a process, a process of continuous improvement and checking that maybe there's not something wrong with the data. I think that's wrong with the algorithm. I think to me that's a lesson that's the most important because what is worrying and we all fear in medicine is some kind of black box deciding something and the outliers just get forgotten. I mean, if you have, I mean, for example, I was going to say, you know, you do an automatic sleep scoring system and someone has a seizure, if it hasn't been trained to recognize the seizure, it's going to just, I don't know, says it's slow wave sleep because it just had, has not been taught. So it's going to make mistakes. And I think it's very important to have a continuous process of improvement of this algorithm and, and surveillance. And I'm just wondering how do you think this should be done? Because all the example Paul you gave were example where actually that's what was needed to look back and try to figure out what was wrong or how to improve it. I, this is such a terrific point. Let me contrast it with something that people say, which is also true, but I think you're saying something more profound than that. So one thing people say which is that, oh, we need something like an FDA for approving these algorithms, which is, you know, like we need something like a testing device. Some algorithms are FDA covered, a lot are not. But the idea that we need something like we have with drugs that test them going in is something that's in the air. You're saying something extremely important that I think is even better than that point. You're pointing out that, look, testing on the way in doesn't solve these problems. We need, use the word surveillance, we need continuous surveillance as the algorithm unfolds. Now that's true for two reasons, one of which you gave, which is, look, there can be circumstances we hadn't anticipated either in the test or the building. That's definitely right. Um, you gave the seizure example. But there's another example, which is the world changes. Circumstances change. These algorithms are static. And so if we're going to see the, how, their, how you know, their actual life performance, we need protocols for being able to independently be evaluating them. Now, why that's so complicated is because we need the evaluation to be done on metrics that are not the metrics that we're testing the algorithm on, because those are being constantly collected. We need to evaluate them on the kinds of things that they're not noticing. Um, and so I think that is a big need that's really not discussed very often. And I think that's the kind of thing that has, if people are able to develop protocols for that, I think it would be super informative and I think is an absolute must. I mean, it's an excellent point. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about the algorithm that was used for uh, pain in uh, knee osteoarthritis. Was weight and age included as part of the algorithm? Uh, no, no. Uh, we did it partly to show us the proof of concept. The algorithm was not given anything but the x-ray. So in that sense, it, of course, it would have predicted pain even better were it given weight and age. But we wanted to show without any of those and just the x-ray. Now, of course, it's possible it inferred something about weight and something about age from the x-ray implicitly, but it was not given that explicitly. And we could talk about the implicit part as well. Yeah, I just wonder whether, in fact, that the, the, the apparent bias uh, was uh, due to a difference in the two categories in terms of the weight and then the earlier age, maybe, because if they were overweight, then they would have an earlier onset. And that, that, uh, younger people might have um, a greater apparent pain than older people who are used to pain a little bit. And that might have explained the apparent bias. Yeah, it, it A, could have explained the apparent bias, and to the extent the algorithm could have picked up on characteristics like weight and age in the x-ray, might explain why the algorithm does what it does. Um, it turns out that when we do condition on those things, it doesn't really change anything. So it turned out not to have been it, but in principle, you're exactly right, that, that could have been a, a factor. Um, and so we've got another online question. How far are we away from an algorithm being the first thing you interact with in an emergency room? 
Um, one, one thing, it's a, it's a great question. One thing that um, uh, people may not realize is that ironically, you already do interact with an algorithm as the first thing in an emergency room. It's just a pen and paper algorithm in which we have these scoring rules for triaging. A human being comes and asks you questions which they then enter into this scoring rule algorithm, checks boxes, and then you get scored into some triage rules. So it's, I'm, I'm emphasizing that because people often think of algorithms as some very different beast, but organizations often have the exact equivalent of algorithms just without all the technology. When they create these rules and you walk in, it's what bureaucracy is one big algorithm. Uh, it is you are being reduced down to how you fit check box, how you fit in these checkboxes and you're converted. So I think in that sense we're already there. Now the question I think you mean is an algorithm of the type I'm familiar with. I actually suspect that when you look at these early phases when you're kind of getting in front of you're just showing up. If you look at the limited resource that you have, it's like even getting someone at the health system to talk to you. I, I think we should actually jump the gun and have, we shouldn't wait for this point. The algorithm should be first. I mean, chatbots are free. They, they can be right there. You can talk to them. You can, you know, it's all free disposal. So I think it's a missed opportunity for health systems right now not to use that dead time people have. People are very familiar with chatting with things now. So you could get a ton of symptomology and out already at the beginning. So um, I hope it's next month, I guess is what I should say. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as you can tell, we haven't made it through all the questions online again. Um, there's, you know, this is a, an audience that loves to ask questions, um, but thank you. Thank you for having me.